Okay, I want to thank everyone for coming uh, this afternoon to join us for lunch. Um, for those of you I do not know, uh, I'm Claudia Flores, the director of the International Human Rights Clinic, new to the law school this year. Um, I'm just going to make some short remarks uh, and leave plenty of time for us to uh, spend some time with our star speaker today. Um, I want to welcome everyone um, and uh, tell you that it is a distinct pleasure of mine to welcome and introduce Margaret Huang here. Um, she's a longtime human rights advocate and a very good friend, um, and currently Deputy Executive Director for Campaigns and Programs at Amnesty International US, which essentially means that Margaret is in charge of Amnesty's campaign work in the United States, determining what the priorities are, what the approaches are going to be, um, and uh, working with members to actually advocate for the advancement of human rights here uh, at home. Um, we're especially lucky, I think, to have Margaret here on campus um, right now um, and to discuss these three very critical issues, police accountability, the rights of refugees, and mass incarceration. Um, I think, as you all know, we're in a very complicated time uh, and a much-anticipated moment in this country in which we're dealing with a lot of issues of race and inequality, um, our attitudes and reactions to immigrants and refugees, uh, and the human rights implications of all of those things. Um, we're having difficult conversations across campuses. Uh, we're all looking at these very disturbing videos of uh, police uh, conducting themselves in a way that uh, many of us find disturbing and questionable and wondering the extent to which uh, this visual evidence that we're seeing is actually part of a larger pattern and practice um, of the way that the police deal with communities of color here in our country. And things are happening very quickly, um, which sometimes leads to little time for reflection and careful reactions and opinions. Um, as you all know, yesterday the head of the Chicago police uh, forcibly resigned um, at Rahm Emanuel's request, um, and Emanuel created a task force to look into the behavior of the police here in Chicago um, that Professor Randolph Stone is going to be serving on. Um, these are very welcome developments, but really part of a larger, uh, a larger issue that needs to be addressed and, and much more needs to be done. As all, of, as all of these events unfold and we're facing all of these complex issues, um, we're really thinking about sort of many different social, cultural, and legal dynamics, um, some of which are relevant to us here at home, but some of which are also global problems that many other countries have faced and thought about um, what ideal standards would be, what basic standards should be. Uh, and as we're having these conversations, it's important to have these conversations in that context. Um, the perspective of human rights is one that we are already essentially engaged in. Um, whether or not we think of it this way, the Black Lives Matter movement is arguably a human rights movement, right? It's essentially a movement about equality and the right to life as belonging to every life, to every human, regardless of ethnicity or race. So we're having these conversations about human rights even if we're not calling it them human rights conversations. Using this lens, which is what Amnesty does and what Margaret is going to talk to us about today, is very helpful, um, both from a legal perspective to the extent that we can hold the U.S. government accountable for the commitments that it's made abroad on the right to life, the right to peaceful association, the right to be free from torture, um, but also because it allows us to look at a lot of work that's been done in the international community on what <coughs> policies and practices really should look like if we're going to think about these issues in the context of respect for the individual and respect for the human. Um, there have been guidelines developed on police excessive use of force, there are standards, there are treaty interpretations, all of those things help us think about the problems that we face here at home um, with our distinct particular dynamics within this country, but we also see patterns um, throughout the world. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Margaret, um, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, Amnesty's work here in the U.S. and some of the uh, principles that they're trying to advance and the particular approach that they've taken um, within the context of our country that still in some ways uh, is working through its relationship to um, these international standards. Margaret? Thanks, Good afternoon. Do you all respond? <laughs> Call and answer. Hi, everybody. Um, I really want to thank Claudia and all of the student groups who are hosting me here today. This kind of opportunity for me to get out and talk about Amnesty's work is actually a bit of a rarity. I spend a lot of my time in staff meetings and meetings with members and worrying about everything from finance and operations to um, what our newest campaign is going to be. And I rarely get a chance to actually just talk about how exciting it is 
for, for amnesty at this moment and for the human rights movement at large. So I really appreciated the invitation to come, and I thank you all for hosting me. I joined Amnesty almost two years ago now, so I'm actually a neophyte in Amnesty terms. And I joined for two reasons. I was offered this position of getting to oversee our programmatic work. And after running a small nonprofit for a number of years, I was really ready to let go of a lot of the operations and administrative responsibilities and to focus again on the human rights work. But the second reason I took the position is because I spent the first half of my career doing international human rights. I was working on women's rights. I was working on uh, countries in Asia and the Middle East. And I spent a lot of my time traveling and working with human rights advocates in other parts of the world. And then in 2001, um, a couple of really significant things happened. The first was the birth of my first child. And the second was 9-11, which happened while I was pregnant. And those two things suddenly opened an entirely different perspective on the world for me. I wondered why I was flying around the world to work with advocates on rights issues in other places when what I was seeing here at home was really a transformation of the respect for what I thought was fundamental human rights here in the United States. And at the same time, the appeal of travel was slowly diminishing. <laughs> so I thought, this is actually a really good time for me to be thinking about human rights in the United States. Why haven't I ever done that before? So I looked for an opportunity, and I ended up at Global Rights, a human rights organization that um, opens offices in countries around the world to do a lot of on-the-ground human rights advocacy. And they had a program on the United States, and it was particularly focused on race discrimination. I really didn't know very much about the issues of race discrimination in the United States when I started. So it was a bit of a risk that they took inviting me into that role. But I spent the, la the last 10 years working on human rights and race discrimination in the U.S. And it's been an incredible, eye-opening, fantastic experience. But one of the big takeaways that I got is that there was no connection between my two worlds. I didn't bring any of my relationships from international human rights work with me to the domestic human rights scene. And I had to learn entirely a new set of issues and constituencies when I wanted to do domestic human rights work. So when Amnesty came along and offered me this position two years ago, it was the first time I've ever had the chance to work on both in the same job. And now I get to actually think about, well, what does it mean to talk about police accountability here in the United States while I'm also talking about police accountability in Mexico, in Nigeria, in the Philippines? And it's been an extraordinary experience to really think about what a global human rights movement means and how do we make that real in our day-to-day -day lives. So today, I get to talk about three of the campaign areas that Amnesty is either currently working on or getting ready to launch next year. I'm going to share some of the work that we've done and some of the things that we're worried about. And then I thought I would wrap up my talk today by sharing a little bit of thinking with you about what's happening to Amnesty as an organization. We're a 60-year-old organization. We have 60-plus sections around the world, so those are country offices around the world. And we're going through some major transitions as we reflect about what a global human rights movement looks like in the 21st century. And I'm trying to leave a lot of time for questions and discussions, so we'll make sure we have plenty of time for that at the end. The first com uh, campaign I want to talk about is around our work on police accountability. Some of you may have heard reports or seen pictures or media accounts of Amnesty's Human Rights Observer Delegation on the ground in Ferguson in August and September of 2014. After the shooting of Michael Brown, we had an internal discussion about how terrible the situation was and what we as Amnesty could say. But over the next several days, as we watched the law enforcement agencies in St. Louis, and I think there are more than 90 police forces in the St. Louis metropolitan area, as we watched their response to what was happening, and particularly to the protests, which had been largely peaceful, um, we were even more concerned about the after effects of what had happened. And we actually made a decision for the first time to send amnesty staff members to serve as human rights observers on the ground in the United States. 
And we had our yellow t-shirts, and there are a lot of pictures of Amnesty staff members in the yellow t-shirts facing off against heavily armed police uh, officers who are pointing guns at them in, in the papers. It was quite a story. We actually didn't anticipate the amount of media interest. And we honestly really didn't have a great idea of what we were doing because we really hadn't done this before. So we weren't necessarily launching a whole new strategic approach to our work, but we felt it was really important to convey two messages. One is, this is not just the US that's paying attention or listening to what's happening on the ground. This is a global public that cares very much about what's happening in Ferguson. And as representatives of an international organization, we were there not only to lend our eyes and ears to what was happening, but to make sure that we were reporting out to our colleagues across the world in the global movement. And the second thing was to really contextualize what was happening in a human rights frame. There were a lot of public discourses going around in terms of whether this was about race, in terms of whether this was about civil rights, if it was about police and community relations. So there were many, many discourses on the ground, but what we didn't see was a human rights discourse, which is not only about ensuring justice in the case of Michael Brown, but it's also about the right of people to peacefully associate, to freely speak their minds, to protest, government agencies, law enforcement agencies, because of their actions. And that, in particular, was under threat in Ferguson. There were also attacks on the media. A number of journalists who were on the ground covering got arrested, got manhandled, got thrown into jail for several, several hours without being charged and were eventually released. But we had a real concern about the efforts of the police not only to tamp down public protests, but also media reporting of what was happening. So we sent our observers in, and we started looking at the laws in Missouri. And we realized actually fairly quickly that there was no way that Officer Wilson could be prosecuted for the shooting of Michael Brown. And that is because the state law of Missouri allows police to use lethal force to stop someone who is fleeing a police officer. That's a suspect, not a convicted person or anything else. Not that that would actually make a difference. So, um, so when we realized that all Officer Wilson had to do was say he was fleeing the scene and he would be justified under Missouri state law, that actually there was no case that could be brought. We were shocked by this law. We couldn't believe that Missouri had such a terrible law in the books. So we decided we better take a look at all of the other state laws in the country. And for the first six months of 2015, that's what we did. Our research team went and looked at all 50 states in Washington, D.C. And we released a report in June called Deadly Force, Police Use of Lethal Force in the United States that provides that 50-state analysis of the state laws that address the lethal use of force by cops. And this is what we found. There are, in fact, international standards that guide when law enforcement officials are able to use lethal use of force. And in fact, they recognize that there are times when law enforcement must use lethal force. But it's really clearly delineated that their utmost goal has to be the protection of life and the protection of the security of person. And that is nowhere to be found in US state laws. In fact, there is not a single state that comes anywhere close to meeting the international standards. So let me share some of the, the top line findings with you. You might have seen both The Guardian and The Washington Post are actually tracking police shootings this year, police killings. So we finally, for the first time, got a much better sense of how many people are actually shot and killed by police every year. But the truth is, we don't really know, because it's all being done by media accounts. It's not being done by official reports from police offices, police agencies across the country. It's also worth noting there are more than 18,000 police forces in the United States. So to think about how do you collect data from 18,000 plus agencies, have it all look similar and be able to be analyzed in the, in the same way is really burdensome. And it is one of the asks that we have, the Department of Justice, that they have to create a database and a mechanism that every law enforcement agency can use to make reports on this. <clears throat> 
But right now, every year, the estimates across the board are between 500 and over 1,000 people are killed every year. And the Washington Post has already reported more than 900 this year. We might be up to 1,000. African Americans are disproportionately impacted by police killings. And while they represent 13.2% of the U.S. population, they are 27.6% of the total deaths at the hands of the police. And it's also particularly noteworthy that the distinctions between unarmed people killed by the police and armed people killed by the police are also quite racially disparate. Nine states and the District of Columbia have no law at all on the use of lethal force by police. Thirteen states have laws that don't even comply with the lower standard that was set by the U.S. Supreme Court in Tennessee v. Garner. So we have nine states with no law and 13 states that aren't even at the national standards. None of the state statutes require that the use of lethal force may only be used as a last resort when nonviolent or less harmful means of response have been tried first, which is one of the principles of the international standards. Nine states, and this one really made me nervous, nine states allow for the use of lethal force to be used to suppress a riot. And I think it's a real serious question of who defines what a riot is. Many of you may have seen after the protests in Baltimore that a number of government officials refer to the protest as a riot. So it's a real question of what would have happened if the police had opened up and started shooting protesters and later declared it was a riot and it was an appropriate response. 22 states allow for police to kill someone trying to escape from prison or jail. Only eight states require that a warning be given where feasible before lethal use force is used. And no state has the requirement, meets the requirement of the international standards about warning. Only three states provide that officers should create no substantial risk to bystanders when using lethal force. 20 states allow for non-state actors, private citizens, to use lethal force if they carry out law enforcement activities, for example, helping an officer make an arrest. And only two states provide by statute for training on what the law says about lethal use of force for police. It's a pretty dismal picture. So following the release of this report, Amnesty decided that we had to do some campaigning. And we do have federal asks. Um, we are supporting uh, the Bobby Brown legislation that um, addresses issues of reporting on police shootings, et cetera. But we've also decided to focus in on five states around the country. And those are Maryland, Louisiana, New York, Missouri, and California. And in those states, we're actually working on specific legislation with local partners to try to get these laws either put into place in the case of Maryland or to reform the laws that are on the books and make them stronger. Our second campaign looks at mass incarceration. And you can't look at the situation of our prison system in the United States and not see a human rights crisis. The United States has about 5% of the world's population, but we have about 22% of the world's population behind bars. More than 2 million people are incarcerated in the United States right now, and an average of 5 million people are under state or federal supervision in the form of probation or parole. That means 7 million people in the United States are still in, or have some sort of incarceration or detention or some form of restriction by our criminal justice system. One in three black men in the United States will go to prison or jail, given the current trends. So one of the approaches that's a fairly um, signature approach of amnesty is that we adopt individual cases of people who have had their rights violated. And the purpose of this enables us to focus on helping one person who's been caught up in human rights violations. But they also represent a larger problem that we're trying to tackle. So a year ago, we decided we wanted to take on the issue of mass incarceration and to use individual cases as a way to lift up the issue. 
And so we've identified a number of cases, and this is going to be released in a toolkit that will come out by the end of this year, that symbolize the drivers of mass incarceration. What is causing the incredible numbers of arrests and detention in the United States? So here are some of the examples that we have. We have a juvenile who was sentenced to mandatory life without parole, and he was arrested for delivering a vial of cocaine in 1989. He's still in prison today. He'd been sentenced to probation on a previous drug charge, so he had that record. And the judge, who was required to give him the sentence under our mandatory drug sentencing laws, felt this was a real ridiculous <laughs> sentence that he was being forced to give, but he had no alternative. And so he made a recommendation in the sentencing that he should be considered after, for clemency after 15 years. His clemency petition after 15 years was denied, so he's still in prison today. Another example of our crazy drug sentencing laws is a man who was arrested while riding a bicycle and charged with possession of two grams of marijuana, which it's worth noting is legal in a number of places now in the United States. He was sentenced in 2011 to 13 years and four months of hard labor and no possibility of parole because he was considered an habitual offender for previous arrests of marijuana use. There's a 17-year-old girl that we featured who um, was arrested as a juvenile for the position and possession and sale of drugs. She spent nearly a year in a correctional facility, an adult prison, where for five months she was kept in solitary confinement. She was placed in the same dormitory as um, other adults and the mentally ill because they didn't have enough places to keep juvenile females. One of our last cases is a woman and her infant son who were fleeing violence in Guatemala and crossed the border to seek refuge here in the United States. Um, instead of asylum, she was put into detention, and she was in detention for 16 months when Amnesty took up her case. But I'm happy to report that we've actually succeeded in advocating her release, and she was released just a month ago. But you should know that there are probably a million people in detention right now in the United States because of their immigration status. This is not a small driver of the mass incarceration problem. So that's how Amnesty is approaching these particular issues. We write letters. We petition government officials. We pressure legislators to take action on the individual cases, but then we also call for larger political reforms. And right now, we're advocating for passage of the Smarter Sentencing Act, the Justice Safety Valve Act, and of course, we've been calling for a reintroduction of the End Racial Profiling Act, which hasn't happened yet. Our third campaign, which is actually going to launch next year, is to address the growing refugee crisis around the world. It's a rather incredible moment for the situation of refugees. We have more than 14 million refugees in the world today. And there are more than 32 million internally displaced people who've also lost their homes and need help and relocation. Since the Civil War started in Syria in March of 2011, more than 9 million Syrians have left their homes seeking refuge. Amnesty decided that one of the things we could contribute is we could take a look at the GDP of different countries, the unemployment rate, and the population size. And based on those statistics, we could determine how many refugees each country should accept in a reasonable, fair way. So Amnesty did these calculations. And can anybody guess what the number is that the United States should be accepting of refugees? 200,000. Getting there. So President Obama recently announced that he was going to welcome 10,000 more refugees into the U.S. The number that we should take if we took our fair share based on our GDP, our population size, and our unemployment rate is 371,000. It's going to be a little tough campaigning to get 371,000 refugees accepted. But my biggest concern, actually, and the reason I'm so glad that Amnesty has decided to take this campaign on globally, 
is the rhetoric that is coming out of the United States. The response we saw from the French government officials after the terrorist attacks, where they immediately said they're going to welcome 30,000 more refugees into France, is exactly the kind of response that I want to see from my government officials. And instead, we saw some of the most hateful rhetoric that I have ever seen in a presidential campaign. And it hasn't, it hasn't been reprimanded, it hasn't been corrected, it hasn't been called out the way that I would have expected it to be. So this campaign, which will be a global campaign, is going to launch next year, and it's going to focus on actually three areas of refugee crisis. The first is the refugees who are being trafficked from Myanmar and Bangladesh into Southeast Asia, many of them who are being turned away by boats. In fact, Amnesty just did a report a month ago um, on the fact that the government of Australia paid traffickers to take refugees to another country as opposed to land them in Australia. Second crisis is the refugees who are seeking asylum from Syrian, Syria and Jordan. And we've all seen the incredible accounts of the risky attempts to flee those countries and to find refuge somewhere in Eastern Europe or in Western Europe. And that is only going to get more complicated by the security situation that's been caused by the recent attacks in Paris. The last focus of our campaign is going to look at the people who are seeking asylum in the United States and Mexico because of violence in Central America. And I'm personally very, very excited about this work because we're not talking about that as a refugee crisis. We're talking about the problem of undocumented migration from Central America. And the responses have been heavily focused on enforcement, on detention, on, on repatriation. So we need to change the dialogue about why people are leaving their home countries, why they're coming and traveling in very risky ways to Mexico and the United States, and why that is part of a broader global refugee problem. The last part I want to talk about is Amnesty as a global human rights organization. So Amnesty is over 60 years old. Um, we have more than 7 million members and activists around the world. But I bet you all might be able to guess who the primary membership of Amnesty USA are. If I ask you to describe a typical Amnesty member in the United States, who would you think of? I know people call on you in class, so you're supposed to answer. <laughs> no ideas? Yeah. Uh, college students? Definitely college students. That's sort of one big chunk of our demographic. And the other? Someone like me. <laughs> <laughs> and you would describe that person as? <laughs> um, Middle-aged female. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Highly educated, older, white, middle class or upper class. That's our demographic especially baby boomers. We have a huge number of boomers in our population, which is raising a lot of questions for us as we're thinking about doing domestic human rights because a lot of our members came to Amnesty because we worked on international human rights. And a lot of our youth members and our college student age members are coming because they want to talk about human rights in the United States as well as international human rights. But I think our biggest challenge is we have a huge gap. We don't have a lot of people in the middle between college and baby boomers. And the baby boomers, as they're getting older, might be shifting priorities. So we really have to think about our future. How are we going to bring in new constituencies, people who will feel connected to a democratically organized human rights organization? And it's a challenge. One of the issues is the campaigns we're choosing. Are we choosing things that appeal to constituencies who are very diverse and perhaps not the same as the constituencies that we've had in the past? Another is how we do it. Amnesty for a long time has been modeled through local groups. So students have groups. Local community members can create groups. You formally register as a chapter of Amnesty. You might even get a number that designates where you are in the list of groups. I'm not a member of a group. Anybody here a member of a group right now? 
Excellent. <laughs> We've got one. <laughs> but people aren't joining groups that much. People don't go to the local Kiwanis or Elk Lodges for meetings anymore. There aren't a lot of places where you meet as members in regular monthly meetings. It's just not something that in our busy, hectic world a lot of people are thinking about. So if we want to create mechanisms for people to join and feel connected with other Amnesty members, it might not be a local group. It might need to be some other way that they can feel connected to people. So we're thinking about how we talk to our members and what resources we offer them. And can we offer them training and opportunities to learn about lobbying or advocacy efforts with local officials or whatever it might be. And all of this is happening at a moment when the entire global movement is having this experience too. So it's not just in the United States that we're having this interesting demographic challenge. In fact, across all of our European and global north country sections, this is a challenge. They're all seeing an aging demographic and an inability to reach younger, more diverse constituencies. And at the same time, Amnesty has made a commitment 10 years ago that we no longer wanted to be a global north human rights organization because as a democratic human rights organization, we believe we should be on the ground working wherever human rights violations are happening. So we've made a commitment to investing in Amnesty's work in the global south. In the last five years, we've opened offices in Dakar, Senegal, in Nairobi, Kenya, in Johannesburg, South Africa, in Hong Kong, in Bangkok, Thailand. We were supposed to open an office in Nepal, but have stopped that after the earthquake. We're opening offices next year in Beirut and in Tunis, and we've recently opened an office in Mexico City, which will serve as the regional office for all of the Americas. And what that means is that the staff who traditionally sat in London and would fly out to look at a human rights crisis somewhere in the world and then come back to London and write the report, are now at least going to be sitting in one of our regional offices and working a lot more closely with the activists in each country on how we move that work forward. It's a pretty exciting development for an organization that has had sort of a long colonial kind of approach to the human rights work, but it's also creating a whole host of new challenges for us. And what does it mean to have an office in Mexico City that I now report to here in the United States. So I report to my colleagues in Mexico City about the work we want to do in the United States. It's also a big shift because traditionally Amnesty had a rule that country sections could not work on their own country. And the reason for that was actually to protect Amnesty staff. If you were in a country where you could, in fact, be harassed by government officials for talking about human rights in your own country, we didn't want to expose you to that. But in the United States, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. And we had very elaborate approval processes that we had to go through in order to be able, for example, to do a report on police accountability in the United States. So that's now shifting. And we have the opportunity to be part of the decision making about what work should happen in each country. But it's also creating all kinds of new headaches for our colleagues who are used to actually managing and making decisions about how the work would move forward. So the last thing I'll note is um, the team that has come into Amnesty in the last couple of years under the leadership of my boss, Stephen Hopkins, has really come in with this commitment to bringing human rights home. And Claudia and I had a great conversation, you should probably ask a question about that phrase, about whether bringing human rights home was at all an appropriate phrase to use. I think it means different things to different people. But from our perspective, or maybe actually from my perspective, what it means is talking about human rights wherever they happen in the world. If there are human rights violations here, we should be talking about them here. If they're happening elsewhere, we have to talk about that too. And we should be drawing links amongst the activists who are working on those shared problems in all places. So our work on police accountability is working also with our colleagues in Amnesty Brazil, who've had a major campaign in the last year focused on police shootings of young black men in Brazil. And our work on refugees will be partnering with our colleagues all across the Americas to talk about the crisis in Central America and why it's driving so many people seeking asylum north. So it's an opportunity for us to really think about contextualizing the, the issues and challenges we see here in the United States as things that are part of this global movement. 
as things that we want our colleagues in other countries to also be advocating on, just as we help and support their efforts in their countries. I'm going to stop there, and thank you all so much. Okay, we have about 20 minutes for questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question related to your last point. <clears throat> I'm sure the, the human rights issues are very different, you know, here versus like Syria or something. <laughs> and I know you want to address human rights problems wherever they happen, but also Amnesty International has limited resources. So I'm just wondering how you would scale responses in different areas of the world. Oh, such a good question. That's the constant refrain in my office that we're doing too much and we can't do any of it well if we don't focus. So it's a huge challenge. I'll tell you the process for selecting. We're starting two new global campaigns next year. I mentioned one. The refugee crisis is one. The second one is actually going to start in 2017, and it's going to be on human rights defenders and the shrinking space for people who are doing human rights work in countries where they're increasingly, increasingly being surveilled, harassed, and arrested. Um, how we got to that is an extraordinary amnesty experience. We have, as I mentioned, more than 60 sections around the world. They each get a vote. Um, if you contribute more money to the movement, you actually get more votes than other countries, which is a point of contention and something that is being challenged. Um, so we actually do a biannual convening of representatives of all of the amnesty sections around the world. And we put out a list of options, and they vote on which ones they want. And then the top two were chosen, and those will be our campaigns going forward. Now, I doubt that anybody is going to say, well, I guess we're not working on counterterrorism next year. <laughs> and in fact, we will definitely be working on counterterrorism next year. But at least it gives us a sense of where priority resources should be allocated and helps somewhat in setting some of the, the answers of no where we need to make them. A uh, major current narrative is that we don't have these problems at home, um, and it, people don't seem to like to believe that the problems that exist in America are of such a scale or scope or otherwise needed <coughs> by organizations like Amnesty. Um, and I think that's blatantly wrong, but it's really hard for me to debunk that idea because it seems to be like so rooted in a different kind of premise. How do you get through to those kinds of people? That's a great question. So it's not like the streets of Syria. We're not walking down streets that are torn up from, from warfare for 40 years. But there are streets in the United States where the devastation from economic deprivation is really quite clear. So it, it depends on how you want to look at it. It hasn't been caused by civil war, but there are certainly issues of deprivation and poverty that we should be addressing as human rights concerns. I think those people are pretty clearly intending not to think of human rights in the United States. And yet, one of the things I've often found is when I talk about issues of discrimination, it actually resonates more. There are a lot of people in this country who don't believe we have a right to health care. But if I talk about inequities in access to health care and quality of health care, everybody agrees that's a problem. That's not something that we should tolerate in our society. So if you talk about the human right to equal access, the human right to equal opportunity, it often helps get around some of the barriers that they might otherwise have. Just to follow up on that question, which I think is related to the issue of bringing human rights home, you know, that phrase was sort of created in a way for the U.S., right? Because the U.S. is, is you know, some say there's sort of an, an American exceptionalism to not wanting sort of these outside principles to come into the United States and that we will figure things out on our own here. And so the human rights movement came up with this phrase that sort of, you know, supported the um, advocacy for human rights in the United States, but in a way that acknowledges that it was something we actually had to actively do, <laughs> right? Bringing human rights home, not that we would just want to enforce human rights here at home. Um, and I guess my question for you, Margaret, and I think you started answering it, is how does Amnesty change its advocacy strategies within the U.S.? Because it is a slightly different context um, than some other countries that sort of accept human rights as right. something they need to comply with and something that's actually part of their culture. Um, how does Amnesty change its strategy or its messaging or the things that it focuses on to sort of tailor its advocacy within this environment? That's a great question. So it's, um, it's not that we necessarily change our strategies. We definitely change our messaging. I think um, one of the things we found is we'll often work with a member of Congress, for example, on the crisis in Syria. And we might get a fairly conservative member of Congress 
to sponsor a piece of a resolution or a piece of legislation that would actually try to provide assistance or aid or something like that. And if I go back to that same member of Congress and I say, and now we'd really like to work with you on police accountability in the United States and, and making sure that our cops are abiding by international standards, they'll laugh me out the door. So I have to really think about how I present, and we actually work with really different people on all of our legislation. So it's the same strategies in terms of identifying champions, working on language with those folks, thinking about who we can pressure in their home districts to help weigh in on the need for supporting something like this. But the messaging is quite different, and probably the people are quite different in terms of who we're reaching out to. Um, so thank you for talking a little bit about the shifting demographics. Mm -hmm. and so. Part of my question is, um, going into the fields, particularly police accountability and mass incarceration, you're definitely entering a space where a lot of African American groups have already established themselves. Yeah. So as an organization that is going into that field, how, there's kind of two challenges that I see. The first is, um, as an organization, how do you hold yourself internally accountable for not replicating the same biases yeah. in, in that, that inform some of these issues? Um, and then two, kind of like the way you have to work with more conservative members, how do you also have meaningful connections with the established groups that might be working on issues in a way that make demands that amnesty isn't comfortable with or they feel like amnesty isn't being as critical as they should? So, I mean, I'm kind of interested in how you negotiate that space. Yeah, that's a great question. So we've actually spent a lot of time in the last year and a half thinking about how we reflect the same biases of our society inside our organization. And actually, um, uh, over the summer, we made a decision that we were going to launch a new initiative at Amnesty internally for Amnesty staff and members around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it is an ongoing process. It's going to involve a lot of training, not only of staff, but of our member leaders around the country. And it is encouraging us to think about doing our work in new ways. I will say in the last two years, we have tried using very different approaches on this work. Um, it's a very typical amnesty approach to go into a situation, to produce a report, to get some high-level media and public attention, and then to move on to the next thing. We're trying to shift that. So in Ferguson, we have not wanted to play a leadership role. That's not appropriate for Amnesty. So we have been supportive of the local groups on the ground, and we've been supporting their advocacy efforts. So we've actually worked with groups who've identified what their major asks are, following up on um, both the police accountability but also sort of other city regulatory changes, and we've been supporting their efforts on the ground in Missouri. We've also worked with groups to meet with Missouri senator, uh, legislators to talk about legislation that we want to see introduced after this, um, after this experience. But we're not, and we don't make any claims to be leading work on Ferguson or, frankly, on Baltimore or any of the other places where we've turned up because we do respect the fact that we're new to the scene. And the things that Amnesty can offer are an international voice and scrutiny and the chance to bring in attention from people who otherwise might not notice what's happening. So that's what we feel is our, our offer, and it's not to play a leadership role or to make the decisions about what should be asked. By the way, in Baltimore, we've actually started working, um, after the, the protests last April, we started working with a number of groups in Baltimore. And the coalition is getting ready with a number of legislators from the state to introduce legislation in January that's going to change their police use of force laws, which is really exciting. And again, we're a member of the coalition, so we'll bring our resources to bear where they can be supportive. On the issue of uh, police and police accountability, um, several observations mm -hmm. related to questions. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, 
Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. So let me try to get to all of your questions. In terms of how we connect with groups around the issues, we've actually prioritized um, working at the local level with groups who are already addressing issues of police accountability in those five states that I talked about. We're also working with a national coalition on some of the federal legislative reforms. So there's a lot of groups that we've been working with who are part of this effort. And again, it's not Amnesty's effort alone. It's, it's part of a larger coalitional effort. With the Inter-American Commission, yes, we, we also attended the, the hearing at the um, commission this past fall. And they're not the only international institution that's starting to look at issues of both police accountability and actually writ larger gun violence. In fact, last year, there were three treaty body reviews of the United States in the last two years. So we have ratified three international human rights treaties, the Treaty Against Torture, the Treaty Against Racial Discrimination, and the Treaty on Civil and Political Rights. All three treaty bodies did a review of how the U.S. is doing in compliance with those obligations, and all three bodies called out issues of police abuse, police violence, as a major concern and violation of the treaty obligations. So the U.S. is hearing this from a lot of different sides. And next summer, the UN High Commissioner's Office is coming out with a report on gun violence and state obligations to address violence, including violence by law enforcement agencies. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity at the international level to be working on these issues across borders. On Chicago, I know what a timely moment to be here to do this talk. I mean, this has been a rather extraordinary few days in terms of what's happened, what's been released, and how people have responded. A year ago, Amnesty started working with a coalition of groups here in Chicago as part of our Stop Torture campaign. And we decided to adopt the Chicago City Torture Reparations as our domestic campaign within the larger global Stop Torture work. And so we worked with the Chicago, Chicago Torture Justice, Justice Memorial. Memorial. Thank you. I always get those mixed up in order. The Chicago Justice Torture Memorials, um, as well as uh, We Charge Genocide and I can't remember the other groups in the coalition, but there were four or five of us who sat down together and worked out the strategy for winning the ordinance that was adopted this past June. And for those of you who may not know, Chicago made history. It's the first time that a city has offered both financial but other reparations to people who were tortured by law enforcement. One of the things I'm most moved by is that the torture survivors asked that the experience that they had be taught in Chicago public city schools. And so now there will be something in the curriculum in every Chicago city school that talks about what the police did through John Burge, the police commander, and what happened to the men who survived his torture, which I think is an extraordinary legacy. So we've done that work, and I know this same group is now spending a lot of time on the next issues around police accountability, which includes Laquan, but it also includes Holman Square and a whole lot of other things that are going on. Chicago's at the epicenter, there's no question. Um, and I think we have to be thinking about how we, as an international organization, can step up to support. 
But there's tremendous groups here in Chicago who are leading the way. And so that's another place where I would continue to support our allies on the ground and look for ways that we can lift it up to a, either a larger national or international voice. And the law school actually this year is supporting amnesty research as well. Yes, thank like in you. The International Human Rights Clinic, some of the students are doing a review of um, police department policies in major cities in the U.S. on excessive use of force. So, and we will have ongoing projects with them as well. I think we have time for maybe like one or two more questions. Um, I was wondering, you talked a little bit about the research element, and um, as AI adapts and the future, how do you think the research arm will develop, and what changes do you see moving forward? Mm. So research has always been a really um, significant area of work for Amnesty. I think most people think of our sister organization, Human Rights Watch, first when they think of researching on human rights issues, and Human Rights Watch does produce fantastic reports. But Amnesty has always done our own research, and I have to say it's often um, a little more lefty and a little more radical than Human Rights Watch's work, which is fun, and it actually helps because it pushes all kinds of different directions when we need it. It's definitely going to be a major focus. The difference is that the research is now going to be done through the regional offices rather than by people sitting in London, which I think is a major plus. Um, I do think there's going to be a lot more emphasis put on trying to be responsive to human rights crises and situations that are emerging. We always have planned research it's, that's always in the works. So there are experts on almost every country in the world who produce research reports regularly on their country or their thematic issues. But we also are really trying to invest in more immediate research in response to a crisis. And the value of that is to try to get more information out about what's happening as quickly as possible so that you can persuade people to pay attention and hopefully intervene before it gets worse. So I think that's a place where we're going to do a lot more investment going forward. Did that answer your question? Um, can you explain that a little bit, though? How is the research arm going to be restructured? What does it mean that um, the research is now going to be stationed in local offices? Oh, sure. So, for example, um, for the last few decades, there have been two researchers sitting in London who've been doing research on the United States and producing reports on, for example, the death penalty or Guantanamo sitting in London. <laughs> so I've been really amused by that. So they're actually going to be moving to the United States. They're going to be sitting in our offices, and they're going to work with our research team to figure out the agenda for what we want to focus on. And that's especially good because there have been times when they've done really good reporting, but on issues that I never would have picked because I can't really campaign on them here. So I think we have a much better sense of where the research could really help to persuade policymakers to change something that maybe is possible to change at this moment, as opposed to something which is important and absolutely a human rights concern, but is not going to see any traction on po political or legal reform for some time. Yeah? I have a question about maybe the emotional aspect of your job. Like when you deal with rhetoric and policies that deeply and intimately impact people's lives, how do you stay level-headed when people spew hateful language or things that are implicitly or explicitly racist to people? That's a good question. <laughs> um, it's tough. I do have days when I wonder if I'm ever going to see really substantial change in my lifetime. And maybe the answer is no, because we've always had human rights problems. Um, but I have to believe, and I have to because I'm an activist, so you have to believe, that we can make changes on really important things. So we'll probably never solve all of the human rights crises out there. But if we can get into that debate and help push back on some of the narrative that I don't see coming from other political leadership around the hateful response, for example, to the refugees, then that is a really good day. And that inspires me to come back tomorrow and try to tackle something else equally impossible. So, I just want to cite two victories that local amnesty and national amnesty help. Just so you know, we don't lose everything. Um, <laughs> the closure of the Supermax prison in Illinois and mm -hmm. TAMS um, was an effort which combined um, work done by the families of the inmates who were in, you know, 365 day a year solitary confinement and many of them becoming psychotic. Um, Amnesty locally worked on it. The UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Juan Mendes, came here and met with 
um, people and sent a letter to the governor. Um, and then also the, the victory in the police torture reparations. I mean, the police torture cases have been going on for well over 30 years, and it shows that you know your hair is going to look like mine by the time you win some of the victories and projects that you're starting on now. But um, we do win some, and when you do, it re-energizes you. And Amnesty locally and nationally has played a really important part. Lance, I was just looking at my phone because I have pictures of when Amnesty brought their national convention here a year ago and had hundred no a hundred and twenty some volunteers standing on the plaza of City Hall downtown with banners, big black banners on sticks with the names of all of the men who had been tortured by John Birch and his people. And that was part of the rolling campaign that finally resulted in the reparation. So when Amnesty brought their whole national organization here and helped local activists focus on this very local issue, it was extremely helpful. I think that's a really good note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.